All right. So um, I've known Louis for what, more than three years or four years. And the last time we were presenting together, we were actually presenting on questions around academic life, but temporality. And, um, and so one of the things that I have shifted from is I used to look a lot on the literature on Global North and temporality. And really what this paper and on my, uh, our current work, our current project is trying to decenter the Global North production about academic temporality in higher education. And in this particular paper, we're trying to decenter the Global North production about work-life balance in higher education, okay? So um, in this paper, what we do is we focus on Bangladeshi women's faculty experiences as an example of how a temporal gaze can help illuminate the interrelationships between time, gender, space, relationality, agency, underlying work-life balance in an urban global South um, context in South Asia. So just to quickly get started, um, by um, work-life balance, what do we mean? Um, there, there, it's a contested term, it means many different things, but for us and for the purpose of this presentation, what we're referring to is the negotiated harmony among various roles, spaces, and or one's body. As I said earlier, most of the literature on work-life balance in higher education tends to privilege the policies and practices in the global north. And most of it is often focused on women academics. And this is tied to you know, neoliberal, uh, neoliberal performance, neoliberal performativity and so forth, um, acceleration, speed and so forth. Those are kind of the, um, usually the narratives. Um, but with that said, uh, more recently, you've started to look at some of the literature that has emerged, particularly in the United States and other places where this, this notion of women has been differentiated, disaggregated. And now we're also talking about men we're also talking about people of color um, in, and what's going on in terms of this question of work-life balance. Um, also, uh, there have been studies on South Asian women academics, um, which often don't look at work-life balance itself, but cites work-life balance to account for some of the social, cultural, gender norms that shapes work-life decisions, but also impacts uh, their career trajectories. Um, yet, despite some of those you know, uh, uh, um, what should I say? The, implicit in many of these accounts is the question of temporality among South Asian women academics, yet temporality remains under theorized. And this is what we're trying to hopefully present to you is what does a temporal gaze of South Asian women academics in the Bangladeshi context look like in terms of a work-life balance? So now Emma will give us a context of Bangladesh itself. So Bangladesh is, you know, is situated in um, South Asia, and it is the world's eighth most populous country. Now, the, uh, the people per square kilometer here are 23,234 people per square kilometer live here, with a total area of 30, 300 square kilometers. That makes it one of the most densely populated areas in Bangladesh and Dhaka, which where we did our, primarily did our study in. That is the central of the country, and here alone, there are about um, there are about what there are about more than uh, uh, there are about two hundred million people. So one of the fastest, uh, alongside that, one of the fastest growing economies in the South Asian context is Bangladesh, and the fastest growing economy, in other words, the newly introduced neo neoliberal policies and the other changes in the economies have have impacted the temporality of Bangladesh. Alongside that, rapid urbanization, overcrowding, pollution, and all sorts of inequities have, have impacted the temporality of Bangladesh and the people, and also the academia. So the next slide, please, Dr. Ress. So now, since we are here to talk about gender and academia in Bangladesh, let me give you a perspective of the number of women faculty in academia here. So the number of women faculty are about one third of the entire population, uh, the entire academ academics of Bangladesh. Although this number is gradually increasing, but the reason behind this increase is also, you know, gendered in a way. So the gendered reason behind this is that the people, well, I think Dr. S insinuated towards it uh, a little earlier, but the thing is that people here, the women in, in particular feel that academia 
offers them a kind of temporal flexibility that the other professions don't. So that is why working women are more comfortable in choosing academia because they have the flexibility, the temporal flexibility of choosing, uh, you know, to, to work and care for their home at the same time. So the, so the working women here, the academics, the female academics, see their jobs as secondary. And this is a notion not only shared by the women in academia, but also the men, which is why they are not you know, concerned about uh, when women do not participate in leadership, so leadership roles as much as men do, because a lot of them believe that this, uh, this the academia is a good place for women to be working women, because that allows them to do their first job which is care for, uh, care for their families. So this brings us to the next point about why we want to study the gender work-life balance situation in Bangladesh. is because here, the work-life balance policies and practices, unlike the global north, do not really exist. Here, there are no formal institutions or policies in academia or other forms of organizations that allow women to, you know, uh, to uh, structurally segregate or have a balance, per se, in work and life. Instead, they often, um, they often rely on their family relations, other kinds of support, so that they can balance their life and work. And we are here to see how that balance looks like. So uh, I'll be the so same, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Emma. So we, in this paper, to understand our participants' narratives, um, employ Barbara Adams' notion of timescapes, which really evokes a temporal landscape um, you know, encompassing of assemblages of temporal categories that implicate each other, but aren't necessarily equally salient given context or moments. And for Barbara Adams, this notion of scape is really important to show the interconnection of time to materials, space, and context. And given the relationship of time being always sort of contextually bound, social difference and social differences become really important in timescapes as well as how individuals are situated culturally, relationally, contextually, the resources they have available, the relationships with power, also experience how um, they, they, they qualify and quant um, experience time from a quantity perspective too, which um, we hope to you know, elucidate um, amongst our participants. And actually, Dr. S, if you don't mind going back, um, one of the other really, um, I think, helpful notions um, about uh, Barbara Adams' timescape or sort of summary of um, Adam's timescapes comes from um, Lou who writes that Adam's notion of timescapes really helps us embody a relational thinking of the complex links across everyday time and temporality, lifetime, large scale time. So including people's lifespans and allows us to probe sort of the rhythms, tempos and contingencies of past, present and future, stressing the temporal features of living and focusing on um, time space of everyday life. Um, so now next slide, Dr. S. We also recognize that increasingly timescapes today, um, you know, have um, engaged and sort of engulfed Western um, clock time logics. And so what do I mean by clock time? For us um, in this um, you know, paper, clock time is really this abstract, disembodied, um, homogeneous, precise sort of um, notion of time reckoning. Um, and derived from Europe, sort of clock time has sort of diffused across the world through colonization, but also through global capital in forms of temporal devices such as a clock or um, you know, calendars. And, even more recently, the internet, right, has diffused sort of clock time logics and practices. And we really situate clock time in our paper as a transnational force today that sort of regulates indirectly and directly how people um, engage in daily practices of doing time. Um, and we also understand clock time to be informing um, representations of the world. So for example, time zones, the fact that we're all gathered here today across different time zones and standard time as well as how one goes about synchronizing their time. And also um, that clock time shapes human agency in, a modern, um, in modern economies where social agency it is really integrated with clock work. Um, and so another way of thinking about clock time is um, thinking of notions of linearity or causality where Western clock time really creates an urgency for one to control time or colonize time through um, anticipatory logics such as 
making a schedule for what your day is going to look like today, right? You probably have something lined up after this presentation. Um, so these anticipatory logics are really creating urgency under underlying clock time. And certainly when we look at the work-life balance literature, there is um, also sort of a work-life balance itself um, derives from notions of clock time. Um, Emily Roberts talks about how in her critique of how work-life balance um, studies have been carried out, there's often a notion of quantifying time, counting time, measuring work and life in these really, um, you know, rigid or rational or objective ways that we're trying to negotiate in our um, paper as well. And so the other um, important notion that we adopt and take up to understand our participants' time scapes is also time work, this notion from Flaherty about temporal agency unfolding in forms of time work where individuals manipulate control, again, notions of clock time, um, manipulate control, sort of change um, their own or others' temporal experiences. And so for Flaherty, um, time work isn't necessarily this controlled, objective, rational um, engagement, but it's an exercise of relationality that's culturally and socially bound. And so recognizing that individuals are trying to self-determine their temporal experience, but they are doing that socially and relationally, right? Um, what do works of time work look like? For Flaherty, it's a wide range of things. It's manipulating and modifying one's time, working on the sequencing, right? The chronological order of one's day of time, um, timing itself, as well as um, the reallocation or allocating time to different priorities or bodies. Um, and then a really important part for us, we were looking at Jack and colleagues work around women academics experiences with menopause and what that does for them in terms of um, time in the larger lifespan. And so time work can also change depending on transitional episodes that unfold in one's life. So um, transitional episodes from being health health related or health scares to job strain to family disputes to family separation um, can shift how people sort of unfold to think back to their past experiences as well as the yet to be what is in the future. So these transitional episodes shift by force in some ways how people were thinking about their past and the yet the sort of unknown the emergent self and what the emergent self can become so these are all sort of the important notions that we're taking up in this paper next slide and i'll turn it over to i think it's dr s so yeah um, we changed the abstract a little bit um because this is a work in progress um in the abstract that we sent to yasser we said six uh, women's faculties narratives, but we actually distilled it further to three because we wanted to present to you richer stories of what's going on to show the complexity of how temporality operates. Now, these uh, narratives that we're going to share in this particular paper stems from a larger study that examines the ways in which Bangladeshi faculty make sense of and experience time across various university types. And this data was collected um, in between February and March 2020, right before COVID hit. Um, now, I think a lot of things may have changed uh, since we, uh, we've collected this data, but I think it still has a lot of relevance to this day. And this data involves semi-structured interviews with 22 Bangladeshi academics, campus visits and observations across four different universities located in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, some of these were public research universities and two of them were uh, private university uh, teaching and uh, research intensive. Uh, it included uh, nine females and male 13, um, which ranged from 11 senior to junior. And it consistently, um, uh, it, the dominant representation was of Bengali Muslims, which is the ethnic majority in Bangladesh, but there were some Bengali Hindus and one ethnic minority. And we conducted 60 to 80 minutes semi-structured interviews, both either in Bang Bangla or English, covering different, different aspects of their academic life, such as roles and tasks, trajectory, academic career, work family balance, and also includes their perceptions of time, the relationships and dilemmas with time in their academic work and the role of affect within such temporal context. Um, so what we are doing in this particular paper, because we cannot cover everything, we are gonna argue that a temporal lens helps us surface how work-life balance is a subjective and agentic work in progress process. And it's negotiated among multiple temporal domains, such as one's lifespan, transitional periods, 
and or other temporal constraints. And we're gonna illuminate this argument by sharing three narratives. One is from Hamida, who's a married retired professor um, at working at a public university. Then we're going to share Sukanya, who's a single junior female faculty member, who's also an ethnic minority. And Aisha, who is a single mother um, and who's a junior faculty member in the humanities. So, um, and each one of us is going to share with you um, these narratives. So we're gonna start with Hamita, uh, with Emma. <clears throat> and Emma, uh, just in case, maybe you might want to switch off the video because sometimes uh, you get cut off. Okay, sure. Uh, let me know if that happens again, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. S. So um, I'm switching off the video due to internet troubles. So I'll move on to uh, our narrative about Hamida. And to her, we talk about how work-life balance is not a you know, overnight process, but rather a process that unveils throughout one's life and has the effects uh, and how transitional periods, like Steve and Dr. S mentioned, affects work-life balance and notions of it. So let me introduce Hamida first. She is a professor of applied sciences at the public university. Uh, she also, she's also a renowned scientist who is internationally uh, known. And when we interviewed her, she was on the last year of her academic career, which means she's probably retired now. So her present life right now is, uh, when we try to explain her present life, we have to say that right now, she has her work life and personal life completely segregated. And by completely segregated, I mean completely segregated. You know, she is like, she tells us that she wakes up at, uh, you know, 4.30. Then she walks for some time, has lunch, uh, has breakfast, prepares lunch for uh, having it at work. Then she leaves. She has a chauffeur and a car. And she also, she lives in on campus, you know, on campus. So she doesn't, it takes her about seven to eight minutes to reach the university. So that concludes her uh, uh, personal life in the morning. After that begins her work life and she tells us how routinized all of this is. By routinized, it's also, you know, clock time bound. Uh, she arrives at the university and takes exactly one hour to see what others are doing in the field. Then she helps her students in their research. She does some of her own grants writing. Then exactly one hour later, she takes a class and exactly at 12, like, you know, like exactly five to five minutes, more or less, she goes down and has a cup of tea, socializes with the teachers in the teacher's house, and that lasts for 15 minutes. And then she comes up, you know, that has lunch or does whatever else. And this way, she tells us how everything in her day is clock time bound, very routine, and completely segregated. You know, work and personal lives are completely segregated. In the home arena, she has her personal life, and in the work arena, she has a work life. She does not take work home. And she does this when you think of time work, as Nasib told us before, there are various forms of time work. And here we see that uh, Hamida's time work is basically sequencing. Like she sequenced one thing after the another so that she could, uh, she manipulated her own time so that she could separate the two. And after reaching home, she has, you know, uh, although she has a computer at home, she does not work. She read, uh, reads the newspaper, uh, has some time with her spouse, and then she's also uh, very strict about her sleeping time and also her breakfast and dinner time. Now, her lunch time that she is not very. Uh, she says that she has lunch whenever she has the time in between work. That is the only meal time that we hear her not being routinized. So here we see that uh, her sleep time and morning and. Uh, uh, night meals, breakfast and dinner are very, uh, very sequenced. And I believe that this is something to do with self care. So here, I think she is using clock, uh, clock time, but in the home arena, she's using clock time and using the notion of work life balance to take care of herself, which is something similar to what Emma Roberts wrote in her paper that Nasi mentioned earlier. The first, the next, next slide, please. So we told how Hamida is very balanced in terms of the, her current life. Everything is in place, nothing collides with nothing. But in the past, as she tells us, this wasn't the case. She used to take a lot of work home. And once she was a teacher, uh, was a, sorry, uh, a chairperson of a newly formed department, 
which where she had to put in a lot of work and she used to take all those work and the worries alongside it about the new the admitted students work uh, she used to take all those uh, types of work home and used to discuss it with her husband so one incident happened with her about uh, you know about taking work home with her daughter her daughter back then was very uh, you know, a kid of about nine to ten years and she was in the mid stage of her career so her daughter she asked one day her daughter uh, she asked her daughter to one day sit by her side because she wasn't feeling well. And her daughter said something like, go and talk to your new department students. You don't need me or something like that. So that really, you know, uh, that really marked something for her and which is since then, she has not ever taken work home. So this was a family dispute or transitional period as we'd like to say, that marked her using the, the recalibration, another form of time work to, you know, keep work and life separated. And when she did that, she still had the same amount of work to do, but as a form of recalibrating, she used to have smaller lunches, used to have less networking time with colleagues, but she always made sure that her work life and personal life were separated. Here she deployed another form of time work, which is recalibration, and this continues even up to now. So here in Hamida's case, we see that her work-life balance is an amalgamation of many things. It was not an overnight process, rather, she is now the you know in the balance stage that she is because of a number of things such as change timescapes. Now she does not have uh, childcare in her timescapes, for example, so she can allocate that time to something else. She has also changed her uh, form of time work. She now sequences everything, uses clock time to her benefit, uh, you know, benef uh, benef uh, benefit, and now she has. And also another driving factor for her work-life balance is familial support or other forms of resources. For example, I mentioned earlier that she has a car, she lives on campus and a chauffeur to drive her. So that is a form of resource that not everyone has because in Bangladesh, uh, we talk about it in another paper, in Bangladesh traffic is a huge deal. And if you live not very close enough and you don't have a car of your own, you have to take local transportation, then that changes a lot of your time scale. So this is a resource that she uses uh, and if this helps in the work-life balance that she has right now, she also has a very supportive husband who helped her and support her to manage child care time in, you know, within and across her work time. And also she mentions one, uh, another very interesting factor, which is that in Bangladesh, as I mentioned earlier, the women's primary job is, you know, uh, expect, expected to be their family and caring for their families. And this is an expectation from in-laws, in spouses, uh, one's own family sometimes. So this is something that was present for Hamida in the early stages of her life as well. But she tells us that as she started gaining recognition and international fame with her research, that changed. That her expectations about being the typical housewife uh, did not exist anymore gradually. And now that expectation doesn't exist at all. So all of these factors, which was not you know, a one day process rather developed over throughout her entire life is something that's helped in the work life balance she that right now has. So that is how Hamida's narrative complicates the notion of work life balance. So next, I think uh, Nasi will talk about uh, uh, Shukanya. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. Yes, so before I get into Shukanya's narrative, um, one of the prevailing sort of time work strategies that Shukanya's narrative evokes is um, recalibration. So what do I mean? Emma talked a little bit about recalibration, but just to make sure we're all on the same page for those of us like me who have recently learned about time work, right? Um, recalibration is adjusting priorities to match shifting relations um, with objects in one's life. Objects, you know, defined broadly from relations to context to um, values, right? So for Shikanya, um, her timescape evokes um, across or spans across multiple temporal categories from academic mobility to bodily constraint, job strain, and recalibration of career trajectory to open up temporal autonomy to prioritize her health. And so for Shikanya, one of the things that we're seeing in her narrative um, that sort of is informing work-life balance literature broadly is that there's often, um, there's been a sort of a, maybe, um, you know, just 
an oversight or a, maybe a lacking opportunity in thinking about how academic mobility, one's privilege of being able to be mobile, um, to leave Bangladesh for studies um, elsewhere in the global north can inform the time work strategy that then is taken up such as recalibration. So in order to contextualize what I'm saying, I wanna introduce you to Shikanya who is a senior lecturer at a private university in the School of Business where she teaches finance and accounting um, as well as statistics. And Shukanya, prior to academia, was actually working in the corporate sector. Um, her original bachelor's degree is in STEM. She has a background in computer science engineering, but found um, STEM to be very isolating for women in Bangladesh. And so she eventually went on to get her master's in business, her MBA in Bangladesh before engaging in academic mobility in the global north where she ended up getting her second master's in finance. Um, she went abroad on a Bangladeshi government scholarship, which required her to come back and give back to the country and the nation by working. And so she chose to actually work in the corporate sector for six years before deciding to shift into um, you know, the academic career space. And so for Shukanya, in terms of her um, even familial or relationships, which are very important for her. She's one of three children. She lives with her um, parents who she provides care for. And she is, um, you know, her, her sister lives nearby, her niece and nephew are nearby, but she's a primary sort of caretaker for her um, aging parents. And so for her, her daily timescape or sort of her daily timetable, right, um, looks like waking up at five in the morning, taking um, her class prep, if she has any class prep to do, um, praying, taking her prayer, um, and getting ready for the work day, preparing her meal um, with her mom, and then going to work, um, taking the campus shuttle um, at 7.45, getting to campus at eight o'clock, and then really between eight to 8.30, having breakfast on campus, before then um, teaching her class from 8.30 to 9.40. And then after not her 9.40 class, she has time for many things, um, academic administrative work, primarily as a senior lecturer, she has 60 students that she advises that um, you know, she's required to meet with, as well as students from her three course, uh, courses that she's teaching. And so during her work week, which is from Sunday to Thursday, this is sort of her regular routine. So after her 940 class, she'll usually meet with students, she'll engage in some administrative activities such as she's on the academic event planning team or um, advising the triathlon, triathlon club, which is in alignment with her larger values of health, which I'll get to in a minute, but she's taking a lot of time to be present with students during this time. Her other course starts at uh, 110 and ends at 2.30. And after that 2.30 PM course, she's really at work till 4.30. And so this is time for again, additional student consultations, even though this two hour block, she tries to really protect for her emerging interest in research, because though she's a senior lecturer, in order to seek promotion in academia in Bangladesh, she recognizes she's going to need a terminal degree. And so working her way towards doing collaborative research is important for her during this window. But sharply at 4.30 every day from Sunday to Thursday during the work week, she makes time to leave um, campus at 4.30 so she can get home by five. And after five, she spends a little bit of time, um, you know, taking snacks is what she calls it, showering and then heading to yoga. Um, yoga is a very important part of her sort of um, disciplined time. And you can see, hopefully, as I'm talking about her schedule, she has a desire to discipline her time, which is very rooted in clock time logics. Um, and so after, you know, coming home, she goes to yoga at least four days um, out of her week um, and in, is very disciplined about it from six to eight. eight um, you know, she's in yoga class and comes back for meals. Um, and her bedtime sort of routine after eight and 8.30 and is in bed by 9.30. So it's surprising when we look at even not just the three participants today, but the larger study from which Shukanya's narrative comes from, she's one of the few faculty who's sleeping seven to eight hours. In Bangladesh, that sort of seems like an anomaly is what I'm learning from this project as well as um, other projects as uh, in Bangladesh, typically folks stay up much later 
have dinner much later. Um, and, you know, for her, her health is hopefully you're getting a sense very important. So she maintains a very segmented um, sort of approach to her, her life. So one of the key things we're noticing in her timescape is she's really recalibrating her schedule to make sure she has room for health, for segregating her work life um, from one another. And so next slide, Dr. S. So for Shukanya, to understand sort of how she got to this sort of disciplined schedule, right? It's important to recognize that she was engaged in academic mobility. She was in the global north and prior to the global north, she sort of worked herself ragged, but in the global north, she learned values and um, time work strategies such as recalibration. And it wasn't necessarily that she was seeking it out. She experienced a transitional bodily episode. So while she was studying in the global north, she was um, diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. And so that made her very um, interested in learning about health, um, stressors of health, and how she can take care of herself because she, in her words, felt like she was too young um, to, to be having these sort of um, larger bodily um, disruptions. And so she got very invested in looking at how do folks in the global north take care of themselves. Um, and you know, for her, she made observations that I should um, quote, I should have a disciplined life, that segregation that I learned from them. Global North residents are very modern. And so while in the Global North, she realized um, that people kept order, right? So shopkeepers would close their shops at the time that they said that they were gonna close their shops. So she needed to get something from the shops. She had to go during those windows of time versus in Bangladesh, if it's well over the hours of the shop, they'll still keep open as long as they're getting customers. She started noticing that this discipline is really important for her, that health must come first for her. And so she took these logics back with her when she came back to Bangladesh. When she was back in Bangladesh, she was working in the corporate sector and she found herself slipping into sort of the corporate, corporate clock logics of give yourself, give all of yourself to your work environment. She was working on the weekends, on Saturdays. She was losing time with her family. And she realized, um, quote, I realized, she says, that in any office, you are not an indis indispensable person. There will always be someone who can replace you. So this really drove her motivations for seeking out academic work because for her, she saw flexibility in academic work. And additionally, one of the constraints that she was experiencing in the corporate sector was job strain. So though Bangladesh uh, higher education is graduating more and more um, students, there's still a lot of precarity in the job market. There's high levels of job strain from competition to changing regulations and expectations about skills, as well as um, you know, Islam study um, with recent graduates in Bangladesh shows that a lot of folks are graduating with degrees but cannot find um, employment. And so these jobs are very competitive and sort of demand a lot. And she realized that I don't wanna give all of myself up. I wanna prioritize my health in the way that I learned while I was studying abroad in the global North. And so she decided to shift an interview for a senior or for a lecturer position in academia. And it's not to say that when she shifted to academia, she still didn't experience this constraint of job strain. She still did, but she was committed to recalibrating all her sort of negotiations in a way that created temporal autonomy and more space for her body. So for example, she worked with her department chair to make sure all her classes were in the morning so that she had time in the evening. She made sure to be very clear with students that she wasn't gonna give her phone number to students, which other Bangladeshi faculty commonly do make themselves available. But she told students, email me. Um, I'm not going to give you my phone number um, as a way to honor this sort of segmentation and very clock driven um, way of thinking about her work life timescape. And she also made sure to um, uh, situate herself with relations um, or mentors that sort of exemplified for her what disciplined timescape can look like. So for example, she talks a lot about looking up to her yoga teacher who has um, you know, made it a point to really prioritize um, their health. And so in like, she's doing that for herself. And so she's employing all these strategies. And for us, it, it's very um, important to stress for Shukanya that her ability to 
come back, um, you know, to, to her privilege and being able to access mobility and learn time work strategies of recalibrating one's life and career trajectory to fit with health um, is really significant, especially because in the work life balance literature, there isn't consideration for how um, different contextual exposure or environment or mobility can influence some, the values someone takes up. And so for her, um, she continues to prioritize and, and ensure that health is going to come first. And one more example of this before I turn over to Dr. S is she's re recently taken up interest in research. And so instead of adding research on as one more thing to juggle, she's actually let go of other commitments at work. So she's negotiated, um, uh, she used to advise the triathlon club also in alignment with her health goals. But she's forego. Um, she for is she is at the time of the interview. She foregoed um, involvement with the triathlon club to make sure she had the same sort of volume of space at work for her new desire to engage in research. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. S. All right. So um, thank you. Um, so I hope you see how rich narratives can provide so much more complexity of academic lives instead of the usual thematic analysis we tend to see in a lot of higher education research. And this is the power of narrative is to highlight the complexity, the stories, the trajectories and show the fluid concepts of work-life balance. So with that said, I'm going to now talk a little bit about Aisha. Um, Aisha is a junior faculty member in the social sciences and works at a small private university where she has been working now for the past 10 years and currently teaches about four um, humanities courses every term. She already has a master's and is currently a doctoral student at a public university and aspires to study abroad. However, Aisha recently separated from her partner. She is a single mother to a young daughter and lives with her mother. Um, they have the hired domestic help. Now, when we asked Aisha, uh, what does your typical day look like? And this is why when you're hearing from our other uh, colleagues, that was one of the interview questions we had is what does a typical day look like? And that's why we can tell you chronologically what their life looked like. Um, she said that she begins uh, by waking up at 6.30 a.m. and then prepares a meal, breakfast and lunch for herself and her daughter. Um, despite having domestic help. And she does that because she doesn't want to wake them up, she said. Um, and like many Bangladeshi middle-class families, Aisa also has a chauffeur who drives her and her daughter to school one, and work. Once she arrives at work, she has the breakfast she had prepared in the morning, reads the newspaper, preps for class respectively. After teaching her first class, she then goes on to lunch break where she socializes with colleagues which is very interesting that every time you hear us talking about lunch break, there's always a social element to it. It's not like I'm just sitting in my office and having lunch. Um, between lunch break and afternoon class, Aisha engaged in doctoral studies work and then preps for her next class. Um, after teaching that afternoon class, she takes the shuttle bus from campus to home. Once at home, she supervises her daughter's homework. A typical among Bangladeshi families, Aisha and her daughter are at the dinner table by 8.30 p.m. Usually people in Bangladesh tend to have dinner around 10 p.m. Her daughter usually goes to bed by 10 p.m. and then she goes to bed around 12 a.m. Aisha's me time came in between her daughter and her bedtime. When, when asked what, does she do, what she does for such a time, she remarked that she plans for her daughter, for her and her daughter's next day, maybe reads a book, socializes with friends and family by phone. For Aisha, this letter, latter window of time is the best time for me, she says. Aisha further elaborated that her me and work time were possible because of the domestic help and the mother's support. Or as she put it, it'd be very difficult for me, probably impossible. Like many mothers, Aisha's home was an amal amalgamation of work, leisure, and care time. So overall, just based on what I just shared, um, you can see that Aisha's typical daily temporal landscape is basically derived from an appropriate Western clock time. It consisted of various temporal categories, including relational time, i.e. child care, colleagues, schedules, teaching and bus schedules, teaching prep, doctoral studies, me time, sleep time, 
and or research time. During our conversation, Aisha named her workplace as a second home. When we probed her further, she stated, when I was separated, this is her speaking, when I was separated, the institution was very, was not this big. So my pro, pro vice chancellor and my department head, they knew everything and they were very supportive. So that is why I am more comfortable here at work rather than a few family gatherings. Colleagues are not very inquisitive about my life. Even sometimes I bring my daughter here and keep her in my room with some of my colleagues to take care of her. And I go to teach my class. The typical boundaries between work and home were thus blurred for Aisha, given the former was a safe space that helped her to embody her single motherhood and amid a transitional episode, i.e. the separation. Collegiality and leadership were pivotal in, the time work, in her time work with teaching and mothering at work. Unlike dominant accounts of negative spillover, Aisha's work and home were positive spillovers as they positively enhanced each other. The workspace here shielded her from the larger social societal constraints of being a single mother, offering her temporal agency. Having said that, while Aisha didn't find stress, uh, daily work itself stressful, it was the precarities with her future career trajectory that consumed her. She expressed her concerns about, being, about the temporal blockages she was experiencing in her PhD progress, publication record, and her trajectory towards becoming an assistant professor. She lamented that despite being teaching for a long time, she has yet to publish or finish her PhD. She felt constant guilt for not allocating the prescribed minimum three hours for her doctoral studies daily or spending time on publishing. She continued, I was applying for promotion for a promotion because I had worked in the institution for many years, but eventually I found that I found that that was not counted for promoting me. But in, the institution did me a great favor. Apart from having any publications, at least I got one promotion. Aisha was promoted to consider to a senior lecturer from lecturer role due to her previous administrative service, but needed three to five publications to reach the assistant professor level. By letting go of an administrative role and allocating more focus on her teaching and research, Aisha recalibrated her temporal allocations at work. Futurity thus impacted Aisha's wellness. Aisha also shared um, the temporal constraints and possibilities of being a single mom. She managed a large share of her childcare responsibilities, including school drop-off, homework, meals, and so on. But um, constantly negotiating her daughter's time with her partner's family was another precarious temporal constraint impacting her daily life. Like many Bangladeshi women junior faculty, Aisha also aspired to study abroad in Global North. However, Aisha's study abroad aspirations were tied to her personal life and not her work life because she, as she, her aspirations for studying abroad was that she could be a more freer self, i.e. have less social commitments, and it would ensure futurity for her daughter because she would then get, her daughter would get a better quality education. So it was more about her personal well-being rather than work that she wanted to go study abroad. However, childcare, legal issues, and Aisha's age hampered study abroad aspirations. As she put it, but legally, there are some constraints with taking my daughter. And if I don't apply, I'm growing, I'm growing older. So I'm not going to get admission. For Aisha, legal issues manifest as temporal leg blockages to academic mobility, thus attaining a future self, i.e. her fear self, and future of others, her daughter's education. Such a study abroad time scrape was further entangled with admission cycle temporal barriers, i.e. age. Aisha's conundrum with study abroad and one's age is echoed by academics who feel more stuck and cannot afford global mobility due to one's age. Despite naming such constraints, interestingly, Aisha shared how she carried temporal autonomy privileges as a single mother. As she put it, she could disengage in many social commitments, i.e. social gatherings, unlike her married counterparts. So this is very interesting that you see the tension between on the one hand, being a single mom, having temporal constraints with study abroad, with their daily life, 
yet also temporal agency and autonomy simply because now she could, uh, she could de-link from the many social gatherings that may, many of her mar married counterparts would be expected to engage in. Um, so Aisha's work-life balance timescape encompass temporal constraints tied to social positionality, a transitional episode, cyber separation and legality, Western clock time, career trajectory and featurity. Yet her social positionality as a single mom with maternal, domestic and collegial support reveals how one's time work was derivative of class privileges, domestic help here, for instance, chauffeur, relationality, in other words, colleagues, mother, her single status, and or Western clock time logics. Isis temporal blockages in her career trajectory and academic mobility produce precarious future scapes, concerns about futurity of her career and her daughter that colonize the present. So in many ways, what Aisha's narrative does is really complicates the work-life balance uh, literature by talking about how in many ways, work and home are so blurred boundaries and are tied to relational, relationality, agency, the, 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 the false boundaries between present and future. Um, we're all blurred, but yet we're synchronized with each other. So with that, we're now going to conclude. So in uh, one of the things that our paper is trying to do is to complicate work-life balance by suggesting that it's not a fixed entity or outcome, but a subjective and agentic work and progress process. A temporal lens helps us to complicate balance itself in work-life balance by shifting from notions of quantity, i.e. allocation, distributive justice, so forth, to consider qualities of time the social cultural norms, choices, power laced with individual difference that's negotiated among multiple temporal domains, i.e. one's lifespan, transitional periods, or other temporal constraints. Our Bangladesh example also highlights how faculty around the world do not enjoy the same temporal architectural privileges, i.e. policy programs and services that you often hear in other contexts, whether at the government, at the government level or institutional level, um, that their colleagues may experience elsewhere. Instead, Bangladeshi women, according to our narratives, have creative temporal agency by relying on other temporal resources, i.e. relational and social positional support, i.e. class, education, extended family. Unlike the Global North uh, work-life balance literature, while the role of academic mobility as aspiring returning scholars, uh, scholars have an impact on their work-life balance, the impact of acceleration via technology was hardly mentioned. Rather, precarity with life outside the academy was most salient on work-life balance, i.e. transitional periods, episodes in one's life. So in terms of future directions, we ask how does gender timescapes look similar or vary in other rapidly developing economies like Central Asia, Central America, Vietnam, aspiring to become middle-income countries? How do we revisit the scholarship of academic temporality and gender from global south perspectives and what new questions can we ask? So with that, we are done. And we look forward to any comments or questions.